Hi there and welcome to this video on GCSE Biology for the AQA specification focusing on the topic of communicable diseases. I'm Shumana from StudyMind, where we help you revise GCSE Biology with our helpful video tutorials tailored to your subject, your specification and to you. If you're new here, make sure you click the subscribe button. Whilst you are watching, please leave any comments below if you're unsure about anything and let us know if it's your first time watching our videos so we can send you our free revision materials. We also have helpful timestamps below for each part of the video to help guide you through the specification. So let's get started. Hello and welcome to tutorial one of nine on communicable diseases. So Today we're going to be having a kind of outlined look on what communicable diseases are and we're going to be exploring bacteria, viruses, fungi, protists and also looking at the control of their spread. So first of all, let's have a look into what pathogens actually are. So pathogens are responsible for the spread of disease and so communicable diseases spread from one organism to another. So that can be person to person or animal to person or vice versa. And they can be caused by varying different types of pathogen, which we're going to look at in a little bit of detail later on. And so these communicable diseases can be transmitted by, ve by vectors. So for example, um, the mosquito is a vector for the transmission of malaria. So communicable diseases spread via pathogens, as I just said, and pathogens are just microorganisms that cause infectious disease. So a good example of a pathogen would be human immunodeficiency virus, which causes AIDS. So those are communicable diseases, but there are also some forms of disease which are non-communicable, so they can't be passed on to another organism. So they are often chronic diseases, which means long term, and examples are cancer and diabetes. So now let's have a look into the types of pathogen that there are. So there are many different types of pathogens which can cause varying different types of disease. Bacteria, viruses, protists and fungi can all be pathogens. So as I said earlier, an example of a virus pathogen would be HIV, which causes AIDS. So first off, let's take a look into bacteria. So bacterial cells are prokaryotic cells. And if you remember from an earlier tutorial, we mentioned that bacterial cells are a smaller And they are also more simplistic than eukaryotic cells. So remember that they don't have a nucleus. Instead, they store their DNA as a loop of DNA or in plasmids. And bacteria can divide very, very quickly, which is one of the reasons why they can cause disease. But they also produce these um, secreted molecules called toxins, which can then go on to infect or disrupt other cells in the body. So in contrast to bacteria, viruses are not actually cells, but they are biological structures made of genetic materials surrounded by proteins and lipids. And their method of causing disease is always by invading host cells. So that's actually really important because bacteria, sorry, I'll do that a bit neater, bacteria don't always have to invade host cells. So there are some types of bacteria which are primarily intracellular which means that they invade the cell but most bacteria on the whole are extracellular which means that they cause disease from the outside of cells and we know that they do that by producing toxins. In contrast viruses are almost always intracellular which means that they invade the host cell, they use the host cell to reproduce in and then they burst out of the host cell and spread to other parts of the body. 
So viruses have no actual organelles in them, but they carry their DNA and RNA for replication. So let's have a look at this in more detail. So the virus infects the host cell, so that means it has to breach the cell membrane here. So this outer structure of the around the cell is your cell membrane. So the virus has to breach the cell membrane and get into the host cell. And from there, the virus is going to replicate inside the host cell. So the virus kind of utilises the host cell, uses its nutrients, uses its sheltered environment to reproduce itself. And from there, the virus can then spread to other cells. And it does this by bursting out of the host cell, which causes... Um, obviously, it's going, to, it's going to cause your cells to be destroyed, and that's going to be one of the symptoms that will present if you have a viral infection. So fungi, in contrast to bacteria, are eukaryotes. And fungi can be unicellular or multicellular. So an example of a unicellular fungus would be yeast, and multicellular would be mushroom, for example. So fungi, they get their nutrition by breaking down decaying matter. And they have this chitin cell wall. So their cell wall is not formed of cellulose, which is what plant cell walls are formed of. Instead, it's formed from this molecule called chitin. So fungi feed saprotrophically. So what this means is that fungi secrete enzymes, which will then digest the food extracellularly. And then they absorb this digested food through diffusion. So this, that, this is a really important point for you to remember. So saprotrophic nutrition. So the digestion, it occurs extracellularly, which is a unique feature. And fungal cells can join it to make hyphae, which can cause infections. So each of these are individual fungal cells, which together form your hyphae. Oh, and one more point, which I forgot to mention, was that um, fungi can also produce spores. And these spores, they come off the ends of the hyphae like this. And this is how a fungus spreads in the environment. So now we move on to protists. So we've looked at bacteria, viruses and fungi so far. And basically everything which doesn't fit into any of those categories can be classified as a protist. So many protists are parasites. And the definition of a parasite are organisms that live inside or on the surface of other organisms and gain benefit, but also sometimes cause damage. And parasites often use vectors to transport from organism to organism. So for example, the protist Plasmodium protozoa is a, um, is a protist that causes malaria and it uses a parasite to transport from organism to organism. And in this case, the parasite are mosquitoes. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to say parasite. I meant the parasite Plasmodium protozoa causes malaria and the vector that it uses to spread from organism to organism is the mosquito. So the pathogen is Plasmodium protozoa, the disease is malaria, and the vector is the mosquito. And just make sure you learn how genetic material is organised in plants, animals, bacteria and viruses. So remember in bacteria they're stored as a single loop or plasmids, and in viruses it's just stored as free DNA within a kind of protein capsule. So make sure you do understand how genetic material is organised here because these are good contrasts that examiners might want you to draw upon.
So now let's look into how diseases can be spread. So, first of all, diseases can be spread by water. So water that's contaminated with any pathogens can cause infections because the pathogens can survive in the water and then spread onwards to other people. So for example, cholera is spread like this because water becomes contaminated with the faeces of patients. Alternatively, pathogens can be spread via direct contact. So an example of this is chickenpox, which can spread by touching. Or another example is human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV, which we mentioned um, causes AIDS. And this requires sexual contact for spreading. So having unprotected sex, for example, can cause the spread of HIV. And next we move on to air droplets. So aerosol infection or droplet infection is basically spread through the air when someone coughs or sneezes. And a really um, common example of this is influenza, which is just the common flu, which I'm sure you've all had at some point, and it's spread from person to person via droplet infection. So remember, always use the specification to guide you, because, for example, the specification listed these three ways of pathogen spread, so you know that if you memorise those, you'll be all good. But, for example, in this next section, the specification is quite vague, and so perhaps here you could do a little bit more wider reading and research and look into ways in which spread of disease can be reduced or prevented. But to make this a little easier for you, we've done a bit of research ourselves and come up with five ways in which we can limit the spread of pathogens. So first off, let's start with the most obvious, so improving hygiene. Well, I say it's obvious, but obviously back in the day, it wasn't so obvious, and I'm sure you've heard of the story of Semmelweis and how he um, learned that just improving hygiene in the operating theatre can reduce the risk of spreading disease. So, for example, this can be by washing hands, disposing of tissues, um, making sure that you are um, sanitary when it comes to food pre preparation, and also reducing cross-contamination cont of fresh 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 produce and meats. Another way of reducing spread of pathogens is by avoiding infected individuals. So for example, if your child has chickenpox, the school wouldn't want the child to come in because that would probably cause a bit of a chickenpox epidemic within the school. Drugs and medicines can be used to reduce the spread of pathogens. So some drugs will help to kill pathogens and some reduce the spread of infection. So, for example, antibiotics, they target bacterial pathogens and they do that by altering the chemistry of the bacterial cell wall. And another way in which we can reduce spread of pathogens is by vector control. So remember earlier we said that vectors can spread disease from person to person or animal to person or person to animal, and we can eradicate or control the population of vectors in order to reduce the spread of disease. So our example that we gave earlier was um, mosquitoes spreading malaria. So we can control the vector that is mosquitoes in multiple different ways. So this can be just by putting up netting around beds um, or using mosquito spray or reducing areas of stagnant water. There's, there's a whole array of things we can do. And, of course, vaccination. So people can be vaccinated against many diseases, and we do this by introducing harmless antigen from a microorganism, so it's been deactivated, perhaps, and this antigen then stimulates the creation of antibodies within your body against this pathogen. And we're going to be talking about this in a lot more detail, so don't worry right now, I've very much skimmed over that. But basically, vaccination doesn't stop the infection from happening, but it basically gets all the body's immune system and defence mechanisms ready to respond if the body is ever exposed to the same pathogen again. So that's all for today. So there were so many lists in this tutorial, so I just want to go back and quickly recap all of those. So your four types of pathogen, bacteria, viruses, fungi and protists. Your three methods of pathogen spread are water, direct contact and air droplets, and your five methods of pathogen spread 
are improving hygiene, avoiding infected individuals, drugs and medicines, vector control, and also vaccination. Sorry, that's been listed as medicines there. And what I'd suggest is you go back through and perhaps make little um, revision products, maybe mind maps if that works for you. So for example, for pathogen spread, you'd have pathogen spread in the middle and have five areas coming off it. And perhaps that could be a good way of making a list more interesting to learn. So that's all for today and I will see you for the next tutorial. Thanks for watching this free video from Study Mind. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe to catch our newest videos by clicking below and leave a comment on a topic you'd like a video on. Click here to watch more videos in our series for GCSE Biology or visit our website studymind.co.uk for free past paper compilations by topic and specification.